Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone. Welcome into Fantasy Film Ball, the show where we turn movies into sports and sports into something we don't talk about here. My name is Matt. My name is Dill, and today is the day we've been waiting for all season. It's our final Oscar predictions, but we're going to switch it up a little bit. We're just not saying what we're predicting to win. We're also saying if we had a ballot, what would we be voting for? But if you're new here, consider dropping a like, a comment. We want to hear your thoughts down below, as well as a subscription, because we have a lot of cool stuff coming up here on the channel soon but matt where should we start all the way at the top best picture gotta say dude i'm really excited to be doing the video this way because we didn't get to do like our personal ballot video so it's uh it's gonna be exciting to not just predict the winners but also talk about our choices let's get right into number one the big boy best picture this one's so easy oppenheimer has won the golden globe the critics choice bafta dga sag and PGA. That is a complete sweep. Like, the, is there another option? No, it's winning. Nope. Yeah. yeah, Oppenheimer has this in the bag. I mean, honestly, we talked about this in our revisiting episode for Oppenheimer. It's kind of had it in the bag since like July. And it was just inevitable until everyone came into consensus for it. What is number two? Because like Poor Things has a lot of noms, but will it win much? Anatomy and American fiction. Hmm. So yeah, it's just Oppie with Number two, so, so, so far away. I will push back on you a little bit there, saying that it's been locked since July, because that's a, a fallacy that I think we fall into year after year, is that we see something early, we see something when festivals come around, we go, nothing else can win. I think back to, like, David Ehrlich making a, a tweet after the Fablemans premiered at TIFF and saying, like, I know it's our job to pretend that there are other options, but, like, the Fablemans, we should just wrap it up and say it's winning now. This happens year in, year out. People decide early on something's winning and it doesn't happen. That's completely fair. I guess for me, the only other film that could have overtook it after the early reactions would have been Poor Things. But yeah, uh, Oppie has it here. As you mentioned, Golden Globe, Critics' Choice, BAFTA, TGA, SAG, PGA, it's won everything. A true sweeper. And then, I mean... I guess I kind of fall in consensus with all of those bodies because I would also pick Oppenheimer out of this lineup. I would not. I would go poor things personally. That's what I'd love to see win. I know it has no chance of a win here, but I just adore poor things. Best director, same thing. Christopher Nolan, we can just wrap that up right away. It's a sweep. Golden Globe, Critics' Choice, DGA, BAFTA, he has it all. It's a sweep. There's nothing else to consider. No one else can take it. Obviously, yeah. Christopher Nolan sweeping. And again, I fall in with the consensus because I would pick him out of this lineup. But just like in picture, he and Best Director, Poor Things would be my number two. Like any other year would win my personal picture, would win my personal director. But in a year of Oppie, a year of Christopher Nolan, it's kind of hard to do that. I went Poor Things for picture. I would go Yorgos here. And if not Yorgos, I would put Jonathan Glazer above Christopher Nolan too. But it's very technically accomplished. I can't complain too much with Christopher Nolan winning and he is going to win it's guaranteed it is the lockiest lock that could ever be locked there's a category where a lot of people were thinking it was more up in the air but at least here we kind of leaned more to the locked area at least since Golden Globe and that was best actor Killian Murphy he's got the globe he's got the BAFTA he's got the SAG Paul Giamatti does have comedy globe and critics choice but I think that we're both still riding with team Murphy here for Oppie's yeah. third win of the night of course yeah I mean he has the winning combo of BAFTA and SAG. With the Golden Globes and Critics' Choice, you have to think both of those awards happen in early January. That's where the momentum may have been early on, but BAFTA and SAG both happened in the past two weeks. That's where the momentum has shifted towards. So if you see someone win both of those prizes, they're definitely going to win. Plus, he is the face of the Best Picture winner, and that is definitely going to help. Now for our personal picks in the category, I think this is going to be the first time I derive from the Oscars. Uh, while I really do like Killian Murphy, Oppenheimer is my favorite film of the year, I think I would throw a bone somewhere else, and I might throw it to Jeffrey Wright in American Fiction. Whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Personally, I would go Bradley Cooper. I know that is a very unpopular opinion. Now that said, I do think we should still talk about, like, Paul Giamatti still can win. There is still a possibility. I, I don't want to brush it off entirely. I think he's in a position for a possible upset, but I would say it's like 10% chance of that happening. It definitely is low. Giamatti is someone who like, I mean, people always talk about Killian Murphy not fitting the best actor mold, but I don't really feel like Giamatti fits that either. He Both these performances doesn't. are really not typical for what this category is usually does that would be yeah. someone like Coleman Domingo someone like Bradley Cooper but I just think that the the strength of Oppenheimer overall always should that hey if they're gonna go away from Cooper 
it's going to be Murphy just because that film is stronger. And I know here on the channel, I've been historically the lowest on Holdovers, always denying its chances, but I just never saw Holdovers as a best picture potential upset. So like, it would be really weird if Giamatti came along and if Holdovers wasn't actually in the picture winning conversation. But if we want to talk about a category that's really, really contentious, something that could go one way or the other, complete 50-50, there is no wrong answer until the envelope is is opened best actress lily gladstone versus emma stone of course lily gladstone has the golden globe drama and she has the screen actors guild while emma stone has the golden globe for comedy the critics choice award and bafta where are you landing right now dylan it's really hard for me to pick a avenue to go with because throughout my head all season long it's kind of ringing back to other categories we've had in the past where it's are you going more with the narrative-based one or are you going more with the film and the performance-based one? I just feel like typically what happens is the narrative one does win, but the narrative one is also going to be in the film that's a little bit more popular. I mean, you looked last year with Everything Ever All At Once versus Tar. Everything Ever All At Once was the best picture sweeper. This year, Kills of the Flower Moon's not that. It also doesn't look like it's going to win any other awards and arguably probably not top two in any other category besides maybe score. So like it seems really weird for a solo actress win. I know they've had it in the past, but still it seems weird when you're going to get someone who is in the potential best picture number two film could win three, four other Oscars. Or uh, it's a huge name or zero that that is a case I, I'm very excited to talk about here in a little bit, but is also just a giant face in Hollywood. And I think it comes down to something that we talked about in one of our most recent videos is when do people submit their ballots? Are they someone like me who submits them as soon as it opens? I've done my research. I've already have everything built out in my head. I've watched all these movies by the deadline. I was supposed to watch them for nominations. I know who I want to win. Or there's someone like, no, I'm going to wait until the last possible second to submit something. And I think of it, someone who's waiting, they're going to lean towards the most recent winner which was SAG and Lily Gladstone. Or someone who's going to submit it right away, I think would be Emma Stone because all the momentum was for poor things at that time. It had just crossed about $100 million worldwide. Uh, it's just about to come to streaming. Everyone's talking about it. Poor things won so many BAFTAs, including Emma Stone. And I just think there's a lot of ways you can go about predicting this category as well as voting on it if you were a member. I think there's more positive ways to look at it and more negative ways to look about it. But however the actual voters look at it is the way we need to kind of approach it. I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive here because I've thought a lot about this category. I've flip-flopped quite a bit. My heart is with Emma Stone. My gut is with Lily Gladstone because of that momentum shift that we can feel. And in past years when there's a momentum shift, you usually want to ride with that momentum shift. But at the same time, I'm still leaning Emma Stone. And I'm doing that because... I feel like we don't have enough data to support the idea of, you know, it's the last ceremony decides it. Because looking into the past, yes, typically the last ceremony decides it, but SAG has only been the last ceremony for one year. It's only decided three close races total because last year SAG was last and they did pick the winners of Jamie Lee Curtis, which was a very close race, Michelle Yeoh, which was a very close race, and Brendan Fraser, which was a very close race. Last year, SAG did decide those. Every other year, when there's a close race, BAFTA has been last. 2020, they went last, and of course, that was the year where Frances McDormand won her third Oscar, and Anthony Hopkins beat Chadwick Boseman, who had such a strong narrative. BAFTA got both of those close races right. Back in 2018, Actress was a tight race between Glenn Close and Olivia Colman. BAFTA was last. They went Olivia Colman. The Oscars went Olivia Colman. In 2016, Actor was a close race between Casey Affleck and Denzel Washington. Split between SAG and BAFTA. BAFTA was last. They went Casey Affleck. Casey Affleck won. And then, of course, 2015, Supporting Actor was a close race, and BAFTA went Mark Rylance, he ended up winning. So we see all of these times, BAFTA was the last one, and they decided the race. There's only one year, last year, when we can use that example for SAG. I don't think much would have changed last year if you flipped around the ceremonies and had BAFTA go last. You cannot convince me that Brendan Fraser would have lost if Austin Butler had won the last award. You cannot convince me that Michelle Yeoh would have lost. You can maybe convince me that Jamie Lee Curtis needed that momentum push from SAG. But the other two there, BAFTA being last, would not have changed anything for me. And this year, I'm going to use as a, a data collection 
because with this close race, if SAG calls it because they were last, then next year I'm going to go all in on SAG. But if BAFTA takes it, then I don't think it matters what's last. I think it matters more about the voting body makeup, because think about it this way. Emma Stone has won Critics' Choice, BAFTA. Both awards are not voted on by specifically actors. And I think this might be what we see with it, is that actors prefer Lily Gladstone. More general Academy members might not care as much. It might be a performance that speaks to actors, but Emma Stone is in a movie that people, I think, prefer overall. Now, you could also say Lily Gladstone wasn't nominated at BAFTA, so she could have won if she was there. Lily Gladstone has a very strong narrative, but that said, when was the last time, like, a social narrative worked for someone? The narratives that we always see work are like, it's their time, they deserve it. Last year, Brendan Fraser, he was someone that people had watched for 20 years and now he's here. It's a bit of a comeback. Same with Kiwi Kwan. It's a comeback story. Michelle Yeoh, she's a legend. She deserves one. Jamie Lee Curtis, legend, deserves one. Anytime we've seen a narrative work, it hasn't been because it's important. Again, like think back to Chadwick Boseman 2020, where people were like, this is important. It's not that he's overdue, but like we need to award him. I think Lily Gladstone has kind of the same thing going on where I feel like it's a bit of a manufactured, we have to award this person. I, I don't think most of the Academy is gonna care, mostly because I, I, I really don't wanna sound insulting saying this, but like a year ago, no one knew who Lily Gladstone was unless you would, were like a big fan of Kelly Reichardt movies. People are acting like she has this big overdue narrative. When people learned who she was, when Killers of the Flower Moon released. Sticking with Emma Stone, but I would not be overly surprised if Lily Gladstone won. It's a 50-50 toss-up in my mind, but I would vote for Emma Stone personally. You said that part about narrative wins, but I would disagree a little bit and say that Michelle Yeoh is 100% a, this is a history making thing. I mean, yes, she was a legend, but I think very similar to some other legends that you mentioned, it wasn't the same sort of status. It was like, oh, Michelle Yeoh's been here, been there. We've seen her through 20 years. As we saw her 20 years ago, kind of like Kihi Kwan, but now she's back and it's going to be the first time an Asian has ever won in the lead actress category after so many years of white women winning, saying it was just because she's a legend. I'm not saying that's what you were saying, but just clarifying it out there, is misconstruing it just a little bit there. I still have some detractions from picking Lily Gladstone because one is the case that you just made right there. While she is a name now, she was not a name a year ago. Very Someone very similar to maybe, let's say, Austin Butler last year for Elvis, where obviously his narrative was not as strong. I also think to the point some people make about Lily Gladstone missing back, it's like, oh, she could have won. I think her missing shows that she would not have won. Her not even making a top three or top two, whatever actress is, is very showing for that international voting body. Where maybe this is a very strong narrative here domestically, here with the actors, but I think like you were saying with uh, the guilds, Poor Things is continuously showing strength at their guild performances. Kills the Flower Moon, what has it won in the last two months? Not really anything outside of Lily Gladstone at SAG. And I just think you have to look at large, like yes, the actors do make up the largest portion of the Academy. I just think there's so much going into the race this year and it's really hard to pick a side to go to because just like you, my heart's telling me Emma Stone, that's who I would vote for hands down with a close alternative being Sandra Huller. But using the brain, using how the last body gets this award right, the signs, the momentum's pointing to Gladstone, but everything else that's not momentum is pointing to Emma Stone. And I got bit by this last year, not buying into the narrative angle. I missed out on Brendan Fraser. I missed out on Michelle Yeoh. I should, to rectify those losses last year, go Gladstone here, but I just think the fact that she missed out on BAFTA, it wasn't she lost. She couldn't be nominated. She couldn't make the top of the whole body. She couldn't even be a save. So I am landing on Emma Stone, but just like you, I won't be surprised if one Sunday we hear Lily Gladstone's name come out of the envelope. I do just want to add to what you said about Michelle Yeoh there. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that her being the first Asian woman to win Best Actress was not a part of it. But if we're looking at the reasons why Michelle Yeoh won, 
that's only one of like five different reasons. And I'd say it's like the fifth down the line that it was a historic moment. People love the performance for one thing. She is a legend. I will say, I think she's a bigger legend than you're giving her credit for. I think she's a bigger legend than Brendan Fraser, for example, who won entirely on Hollywood legend status. She was the face of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which was a huge Best Picture movie. She was one of the faces of Crazy Rich Asians, for which a lot of people believe she was snubbed for an Oscar nomination. She has been an action star. She has been a blockbuster star, as well as leading dramas across multiple different languages. I think she had that huge narrative going on that she was truly a legend. She was also the face of the Best Picture winner, and it was a performance unlike anything else that people had ever had a chance to vote for in the past. So those are four reasons. Reason number five is history. For Lily Gladstone, I think there are two reasons why she would win. Reason number one, people love her performance. Reason number two is history, which is why I don't think it's a one-one comparison. It's not the same as Michelle Yeoh. No, I fully agree with a lot of what you just said there, and I think that's part of the reason why I am going Emma Stone here over Lily Gladstone, is I think the biggest factor to Michelle Yeoh's win last year is that she was the star of Everything Ever All at Once, the move that won almost every category it was mentioned in. As I said before, Kills of Flower Moon has 10 nominations. It's number one or number two in two of those categories. Mm -hmm. And that other one where it's number two, it's a distant, distant number two. The other eight, you can make the case where it's number four or five in all of those categories. Mm -hmm. And I just think that shows the overall support for the film. Again, last year, if we want to go back to maybe move away from Everything Ever, go to The Whale, Brendan Fraser was number one or number two in actor and number one or number two in makeup. It ended up winning both of those categories. And you can go to some other movies that may have been in close races, but it had at least another nomination that seemed very strong to win, where Killers doesn't really have that at the end of the day, while Poor Things could go home empty-handed, but also could go home with four or five Oscars. We just had such a tough category where you could make a great case for two people. So let's dive into two categories where there's only a case for one individual person. Supporting actress, Davine Joy Randolph. Uh, congratulations, you are winning an Oscar. Yeah, congratulations. That's it. That's it. Uh, she's won everything, not just Globe, not just Critics' Choice, BAFTA, SAG. She won the most critics groups out there. She won the big name critics groups out there. And like, what's the only like notable law she has? Like Gotham, so Charles Melton, which I mean, Charles mm-hmm. Melton can't really be here. She is going to steamroll. She's going to win. This is honestly the easiest award of the night, even easier than Nolan for director. Now, who would you vote for? in this category because I'm all in on Dave Joy Randolph. <laughs> yeah, well, people, if they're going to make fun of you for Bradley Cooper and Maestro for your lead actor, they'll make fun of me for Jodie Foster and Nyad for my supporting actress pick. That's so wild. I think Jodie Foster deserves... Uh, more ridicule as, as your pick than uh, Bradley Cooper for me. <laughs> I like okay. Bradley Cooper and Maestro, so maybe I agree with that, but I just think that she's doing the true supporting actress performance there. She's supporting Nyad with all her strengths. She has so much warmth to her character. She brings comedy. She brings drama. Uh, Nyad's not a movie I like, but Jodie Foster is something I love about that but film. Did you know that Jodie Foster is in more of Nyad than Lily Gladstone is of yeah. Flowers of the Flower Moon? Yeah, I, I post that in our Discord. For the argument about Lily Gladstone being lead supporting, like, Lily Gladstone is in two minutes more of the movie than Robert De Niro, who is a clear supporting role. You said it, not me. <laughs> uh, now, I'm mean, talking Robert De Niro. He's not winning supporting actor because Robert Downey no. Jr. has Golden Globe, Critics' Choice, BAFTA, SAG. He is as locked as Dave Joy Randolph. There's nothing else you can say. It's just a clean sweep for Robert Downey Jr. There's always this talk about speeches. Honestly, RDJs is probably the one I'm most excited to hear. Yeah. He's just so charismatic. He's funny. His speech is always different than the rest of the bunch. No one else is doing a speech like Robert Downey Jr. So for this whole award season, his always stands out so much. It just means so much different from the rest. And I at least appreciate that. Now, who would you vote for? This is really tough because I do love all five of these performances here. And I think I've had a different moment in the year where I'm like, oh, I like this one the most. Throughout most of the year, it was Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction. As soon as I saw it at the film festival, I just thought he's so magnetic. He's doing so much in this role. I love it. But on my third watch of Poor Things, I think I'm on the Mark Ruffalo train now. 
just so many quotables i mean all of these performances besides de niro's are comedic in a sense and i think ruffalo just nails the comedy the best and just his body mannerisms throughout i think just edge it out a little bit above the rest for me i'm going ryan gosling all the way uh, i love his performances ken it is hysterical and it's iconic it's it's a role that i think is one of the most memorable parts of the film i want to see ryan gosling win an oscar someday soon it's not gonna be for this because it's robert downey jr's year but talking about great speeches ryan gosling would give one of the greatest speeches of all time i wish he won something like it, it could have been anywhere could have even been gotham where he yeah. shouldn't have even been nominated but like i just wish he could have won something so we could see him give a speech, but yeah, it's it's the Downey sweep. Speaking of sweeps, a lot of people were thinking original screenplay was going to be a sweep for Barbie, but it moved oh categories. So now yeah. the race was kind of open to whatever. I know early in the year, a lot of people were screaming for past lives. Then they're like, oh, the holdovers, it's so great out of TIFF. It could compete with Barbie. I won't take credit and say, oh, I've been saying this since May, but I've been saying since Barbie moved. It felt like a natty of a fall to me. And after its Globe win, it won at yeah. BAFTA. It seems pretty secure here for the Oscar. Obviously, we don't have WGA to weigh in this year, but with WGA being after, I don't think it really matters either. The win doesn't influence anything. Uh, Anatomy of a Fall has Golden Globe and BAFTA. It is the only movie in this category that has won a single screenplay prize. I guess you could still argue maybe The Holdovers comes out of nowhere through some last minute buzz, creates an upset. It's not impossible. It's just highly, highly unlikely. And I would agree with the Academy. Anatomy of a Fall is my favorite script of these five nominated. Not that the other ones are bad. I just think Anatomy Strips one of my favorites of the year. Personally, I would go with Past Lives. Uh, I, I think it's a brilliant screenplay packed with gorgeous lines of dialogue that flow so naturally and yet also feel so poetic. But uh, Anatomy of a Fall is definitely not an undeserving winner. Anything that gives more recognition to international films, I'm very happy with. So let's talk adapted screenplay now because this one shockingly looks pretty closed up. American Fiction has swept. It won Good the job. Critics' Choice. It won the BAFTA, and it just won the USC Scripter Award. That said, it's still not as strong a film as Oppenheimer. And so that's hanging over this category. Are they going to go with the film that swept all the screenplay prizes, or are they going to just add on one more Oscar to the Oppenheimer sweep? I would say that's very unlikely because we've seen even at bodies like BAFTA, like Critics' Choice, that overwhelmingly go for Oppenheimer, they still go elsewhere for screenplay they go to american fiction that said you could make some excuses as to why american fiction has performed as well as it has at some of these bodies with the critics choice there's talk about bribes happening from amazon mgm don't know how valid that is but there are reports that in promotion for their film they flew out a bunch of the voters and gave them like an expensive trip as a way to be like hey vote for our movie so you could argue that and usc scripter a possible reason that american fiction won there is that the writer of the book that american fiction is based on percival everett is a professor at usc that is a potential angle for why that film won but that said it's still won. like oppenheimer the only reason you could predict it in this category is just brute strength of the film. For that USC script point, I do agree because when we get to editing later, uh, there is a film that just won an editing prize recently because the editor was the president of the guild. So I have to admit this one is something I would look at a little bit questioning. Uh, Critics' Choice won, it was a very small group of members. So I don't know how much of a sway that would have, but like you said, American Fiction is one where it needs to. And yeah. the fact that it won BAFTA, again, going back to Kills the Flower Moon argument, with zero other nominations, and they still found a way to award that movie, a movie they didn't care about to make it into their picture lineup, a movie they didn't care about to put it into lead actor or score or supporting actor or anywhere else. They made sure that they got this adapted screenplay win. I just think that speaks volumes. And I wouldn't even say Oppenheimer's number two. If I had to pick a number two, it's that movie from original that came over after winning all of its awards, and that's Barbie. My issue with Barbie, and I will admit, I had Barbie win this category until BAFTA. The momentum's gone. Yeah. When's the last time anyone talked about Barbie outside of like, oh yeah, I like that movie, in terms of the awards season? It underperformed at Globes heavily. It missed key BAFTA nominations. It missed key Oscar nominations. And I just feel like this is a film that had so much buzz, so much talking points when it came out back in July, and it really peaked 
in like the early stages of, of award season when we had CCA, when we had Globes, when we were setting all these records for the most nominations because of those extra song nominations or whatever you want to make the case for. That's when it peaked. And since then, it's just been going down and down and down. And now it's to the point where it wins one Oscar, maybe two. And originally, I at least had it for like four or five. Barbie has had such a steep downturn. Now, I do just want to say, if we're looking at statistics, the last time something didn't win anything and then won the Oscar was Precious in 2009. And there was a scandal around that. The whole reason why Precious won was because people really didn't like that Jason Reitman, who was sweeping for Up in the Air, he was not giving credit to his co-writer on the film, and there was some controversy about that that ultimately lost him the Oscar. So if we're looking at Anatomy of a Fall, if we're looking at American Fiction, both films being the only ones in their category to win anything, I mean, Barbie has Critics' Choice for original screenplay, but otherwise hasn't really won anything important. Precious is the only thing we can look back to. I still think there's a slight chance for Barbie, but... I just don't see the pool. Why are voters going to go out of their way to vote for Barbie when they can vote for the hot new thing with American Fiction? All that being said, I think American Fiction has a great script. I think it would be a great win. But if I had a ballot, I think I would still go Barbie here. But I think all five of these scripts, even Zone of Interest, are good scripts and would have a case to win on like my own personal ballot. I'd personally pick Poor Things. It's such an inventive script that turns a horrifying subject matter into something full of whimsy and delight. Plus, it has lines like, I must go punch that baby, which immediately means that it wins in my mind. If I was a USC scripter awarder, I would pick Poor Things over American Fiction. But if we're talking like general scripts i think i would lean a little bit more towards american fiction but i do agree there's so many great quotables from poor things so let's talk another locked category being cinematography because oppenheimer has critics choice bafta and asc basically everything you need to win of course the british society of cinematographers went to poor things but bsc without another win doesn't matter last year bsc uh, and bafta both went for all quiet and that ended up being the deciding factor but bsc with nothing else means nothing. That means Oppenheimer takes it all. I also have Oppenheimer here. Funny enough, I think we've agreed in every category so far. We and have, for yeah. viewers at home who want to keep an Oppenheimer counter for how many wins is going to get on the night, we have picture, we have director, we have actor, we have supporting actor, and now we have cinematography. It is already at five wins. Now, who would be your pick in cinematography? That's a great question because I think the, I, I'll be honest, I haven't seen El Conde yet. I know that's a big glaring omission, but from the other four movies, uh, I mean, Killers looks cool, but Killers would not be my pick. So it's between the other three. I honestly think that if I were to pick one, I might go Maestro. Um, I don't know. I just nice. really think the camera movement, the camera work in that film is very impressive. I appreciate what they did for Oppenheimer, the creation of IMAX, black and white. Uh, but sometimes where they put the camera in the closeness you are in isn't always my favorite thing. I'm not very much a fan of overtly relying on close-ups. And Poor Things, I think, is phenomenal work. I just think sometimes it's a little too sporadic. That is the point, I know, but personal taste-wise, I'm like, ah, it's a little much for me, but uh, I think any of those three films, I think, would be great winners. For me, it's Poor Things again. I know I just sound like a broken record going Poor Things <laughs> for everything. Poor Things, Poor Things, Poor Things. But uh, Poor Things is the cinematography of the year in my mind. The lighting design is so gorgeous and so colorful, and it makes the film so vibrant looking alongside the production design and costume design. But also the lens choice is a big, big thing in terms of cinematography. Uh, and the lens choice is so diverse and so varied and it brings so much to the film but let's talk editing now this is another one it's another sweep oppenheimer has critics choice bafta and ace oppenheimer is winning this and it's got the sound stat on its side that counts six wins for oppenheimer so far and we are only growing now, oppenheimer's won everything it's going to continue to win it's the only film in editing that even has a sound nomination so right there is pretty glaringly apparent even if oppenheimer wasn't the best picture sweeper putting the oscars aside personal pick oppenheimer the cross cutting is phenomenal it's so engaging this film is just riveting partially due to its editing I'm going poor things again. 
boom. Surprise. We need surprise. a poor things counter from that. And just surprise. drop it down here. Well, I mean, I think the, the way that it seamlessly blends these very different visual styles is really, really unique, really interesting. And then there's also the way that it creates this continuity throughout Bella's development, throughout Bella's growth. There's a lot going on here. That said, Oppenheimer would be my second choice in this category. The editing in that film is really masterful, and it's why the movie works so well. But I just have to personally give the edge to poor things. So let's talk best sound. This is a little bit more contentious, but it's not really because mm. Oppenheimer just won both of the American guilds. It won the Cinema Audio Society and the Motion Picture Sound Editors. Plus it is going to win editing. And we see almost every year, except last year, sound and editing go together. And the reason it split last year was because everything ever all at once was just that much of a sweeper. It was just that undeniable. This year, the sound set is not going to break against a sweeper like Oppenheimer. No matter how interesting the zone of interest sound is, uh, no matter how creative it is, and no matter how much of a focal point it is in the film, it's not Oppenheimer. It doesn't matter that it won the BAFTA. Oppenheimer is winning sound here. I agree with everything that you just said there. Uh, regardless of how impressive zone is, regardless if it won the BAFTA, it's going against the sweeper. And uh, the sweeper has what most people would call the most interesting, the most creative sound work of the year. It just sucks for zone. Like I feel like most other years, like even last year, I think I think it could beat Top Gun, but it can't beat Oppenheimer. I don't think it would have beat Top Gun because they really like going for loud sound here. And the thing that's always, no matter what year it's in, the thing that would hurt Zone of Interest is that it's so quiet and so measured. Uh, and that's what makes it so interesting. Maybe it could have beat Sound of Metal. That's one thing I'd say. That's one winner in sound that this could have beaten. Otherwise, though, loud sound beats it every time. I guess I was just going off of strength, the film peaking at the right time. Fair but enough. in terms of, I guess, personal picks here, I'm not going with this film, but I think we're getting too much hate for a creator being in here. I think the sound work there is very impressive, even with the film overall may be a little boring or cheesy to a lot of people, but I would be going Oppenheimer. But I acknowledge that Zone probably is better work overall. Zone of Interest would be my pick here. It's such creative, interesting work where the sound becomes a character in the movie, where the entire film would fall apart without the sound. It's so easy to uh, ignore sound in a movie, and in this film you're unable to ignore it. That's just a a function of the sound in this movie so for me that is the achievement in sound this year but again Oppenheimer I have nothing against this winning it would probably be my second choice in the category now let's talk another category with a zone of interest in it and this one I think we can agree it's going to win best international feature zone of interest is winning it's the only film here that is in the best picture lineup now he's on here uh the only other film here who has another nomination Society of the Snow and Makeup exactly. and Hairstyling which was an underperformance for society, according to some people. Let's give not even not even Glazer. Let's give uh, the UK a prize here. There's nothing else that can happen. It's the same way that we see every year now. I mean, last year All Quiet was just an easy walk away winner. Drive My Car was an easy walk away winner. Another round was an easy walk away winner. Parasite, Roma. Every year it happens, and then you can look back even further to stuff like. Um, in 2009, 2010, when we had Up and when we had Toy Story 3 in Best Animated Feature, when you have a lineup that is Best Blank Feature and it's just the, the film overall and one of them is in Best Picture or in Best Director or in Best Screenplay, that's the film that's going to win. That's not the case at BAFTA. <laughs> because it's not the case won. at BAFTA. That's yeah, but the wild this is thing a BAFTA. at BAFTA. But yeah, here it's it's the case. So what would you pick in this category? It would be Zone of Interest. I've seen um, Same here. I've seen some of the other nominees. I haven't seen them all, but I very much love Perfect Days. I think I like Perfect Days more than Zone on my first watch. But with the way Zone sticks with you afterwards, and especially Zone's uh, rewatchability may be the wrong word to use, but how you pick up so much more on a second watch, tip the scales to go over Perfect Days. And I wasn't the biggest fan of Society of the Snow, so for me, it's Zone pretty handily. I have seen all of these films and I think it's a pretty disappointing lineup overall. I like Perfect Days quite a bit, uh, but it is nowhere near Zone of Interest in my mind. So Zone is my winner. It would be much closer, I think, if The Taste of Things got nominated as it should have been with this lineup, Zone of Interest hands down. So let's talk documentary feature. This one doesn't seem like it's a race, but it also kind of does. A and I'll kind of outline why. So 20 Days in Mariupol has won the Director's Guild Award and it won BAFTA. However, 
it lost the Producers Guild Award and the Eddie Award, the ACE. That shows weakness. But that said, both times it lost those awards, it lost to films that were not nominated at the Oscars. It lost to American Symphony and to still a Michael J. Fox movie. I'm going to say this later in, in the visual effects category. I think sometimes something losing shows more about people looking for an alternative and not having passion for a certain movie than anything else. So Bobby Wine was not nominated at those places, and maybe that could have snuck a win in there. And Bobby Wine is the only other viable nominee for a win here. It did win the IDA, International Documentary Association, award. Uh, but that said, it did lose the DGA against 20 Days in Mariupol. So in the end, I am going with 20 Days in Mariupol. I've been sticking with it all year long, but that said, losing PGA, losing ACE, makes me think that people are looking for other options. I agree with you, which is so lame that we have another category that we're the exact same, but oh, wow. 20 Days has won everywhere and nothing else here really has, like sure, Bobby Wan has the one. Four Daughters has Gotham, and honestly, I think if they move away from Mario Pool, it would be the Four Daughters more so than Bobby Wine. I just think the angle and the relevancy of the story could hit a little bit harder, but I think that Mario Pool has the political angle, the narrative angle, as well as being the quote-quote best film of the bunch. It would also be the one I would pick from this lineup. It would also be my pick of the lineup, too. That said, Four Daughters is one of my favorite films this really year as well. For, it's, it's fantastic, but 20 Days in Mario Pool is hands down, a winner to me. There's also the narrative of Alexei Navalny, the central subject of last year's documentary winner, Navalny, just passed away. And so voting for a film that's still about this conflict, about the war in Ukraine, I, I think it's an easy choice to make there. In the animated category, we have a little bit of a race, but I, I don't think it's that much of a race. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be completely honest. It is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse versus The Boy and the Heron. Now, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse has the Critics' Choice Award, it has the Annie Award, it has the Producers Guild Award, and it has the Editors Guild, so it's got American guilds, it's got American support, and it's got wide body support. Meanwhile, The Boy and the Heron has the Golden Globe and it has the BAFTA, which means international groups like it. Golden Globes are an international body, BAFTA is of course an international body, but it's also worth noting that BAFTA is voted on by a very small group. Not the entire British Academy votes for animated feature, you have to opt into the category to vote for it, which means that that win I do think means a little bit less. It means that it's real animation geeks who are voting for it. That's not the case at the Oscars. It's everyone. Yeah. They don't care. Uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is winning, in my opinion. I 100% agree again. Um, I think, I mean, I've been vocal on this channel throughout the year saying I never really thought it's a race. And even after the Globe, I continue to say it's not a race. It's an international, very small body. And after you had the discovery of BAFTA is a very small group, again, same thing. Smaller groups will go Boyne the Heron. Every time it's a larger group, will go Spider-Verse. Spider-Verse did miss visual effects, did miss score here at the Oscars, but in the precursor circuit, it was showing up at those places. Grand Boyne the Heron did get a score mention at the Globe, but Spider-Verse also got other stuff at like VES and at some other guilds along the way. And I just feel like there's so much more support for this film, which is really weird to say because back in like May, June, this movie came out, this was the people's champ of the year. Yes, Everyone was. was clamoring it for above the line nominations. And now that it seems that Boy and the Heron's out, at least maybe this is a vocal minority. Maybe this is a little bit larger than I'm giving it credit for. People are kind of not mentioning their thoughts on Spider-Verse. Just say like, oh, Boy and the Heron's so much more beloved. It's it's the people's movie. It's what we want to see when like two months ago you were team Spider-Verse. I think it's just people being very loud. And I do think... Something we're seeing a lot of this year is people not predicting with the evidence. They're predicting against the things that they don't want to see win. Uh, I see a lot of people rallying against Phil Lord, Chris Miller, against Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse for various reasons. One reason being the treatment of the animators on the film. Another reason being that it's a part two and they can award part three, whereas Miyazaki's not going to get another chance. Likely, uh, he says he's working on another movie, but... Who knows? So I've seen a lot of people predicting against that. We'll talk about makeup in a little bit, but I think it's the same reason why a lot of people are rallying against Maestro is that they just don't want to see it win even when the evidence is pointing towards it. And I could say, you know, we might be falling a little bit into that with Best Actress with our bias 
leaning us towards Emma Stone. I think everyone is susceptible to this, where if you see an angle for something that you want to win, you're going to lean very heavily into that angle. It's just human nature, I think. You you ride with your team. Uh, that's what happens a lot in Oscar predicting. So I can't blame people too much for picking the boy and the heron at this point. But that said, I think it's like 80% chance it's going to be Spider-Verse and 20% chance it's going to be boy and the heron. It could happen. It's just pretty unlikely at this point. For the sequel argument where Spider-Verse has another installment, I think that also goes to the strength of this film. When the first one won, they knew there was going to be a part two. It didn't matter. They just gave it the award. And I think that's going to happen here again. It doesn't matter if there's a part three coming. It's just going to win this year, and it's going to win for part three as well. And just like the Oscars, I would have given it my personal win for part one. I'm giving it my personal win for part two. And most likely, depending on some miracle, I will probably be giving it the personal award for part three as well. Same here. Uh, this is my favorite film of the year. So, of course, I'm giving it <laughs> the award here. I'd love to see it nominated in other places. I think that the Academy did this film really dirty. And honestly, I kind of blame Barbie. I, I think that a lot of the support that was for Spider-Verse ended up getting branched off to Barbie when it came out. It became the film Twitter slash letterboxed favorite of the year. That and Oppenheimer both, I think, took support away from Spider-Verse. In a different year, could we have seen more for Spider-Verse? I do think so, but I, I just think that having those two phenomenons be so popular online, so popular with this Gen Z crowd that's very vocal on social media, very vocal in campaigning the films themselves, kind of got squashed by, by other priorities. Now let's talk best original score. I think it's pretty undeniable. Oppenheimer's winning. It has the Golden Globe, it has a Critics' Choice, it has BAFTA. It's a sweep. Lock it up. Early in the season, I had mentioned that it just seemed weird for Ludwig to win a second so soon, but what I would need to see for me to believe, because I did not have Oppenheimer up until, I think, Golden Globe, was for him to sweep, and he's done exactly that. He has the Globe, he has Critics' Choice, he has BAFTA, and Oppenheimer is the sweeper overall, so I will be picking it to win the Oscar. And of this lineup, I mean, I, I know this is contrary to public belief. I think this is a pretty good lineup. I really like American Fiction score. Poor Things score just sticks in your head. Kills the Flower Moon. I think it works really well inside the film. And then um, Oppenheimer would be my personal pick of the bunch. But I like all four of those. And Indiana Jones isn't awful like other people said. I just probably wouldn't have nominated it. Just to give credit to an earlier prediction you had, you had Killers of the Flower Moon because... Technically, Oppenheimer is not a sweeper. Killers of the Flower Moon did win the Music Guild, HMMA. So it's not a full sweep, but it's basically a sweep. It's a sweep of the important places because HMMA doesn't really matter that much. It's just an interesting early indicator. Personally, I would pick Poor Things here. Wow, surprise, I'm picking Poor Things again. I just love that score. It's the one score this year in the category that I think is an all-timer. I don't love the Oppenheimer score to be completely honest. So, uh, I mean, I've, I've said my full thoughts on the score many times before. I won't linger too much on it, but uh, Poor Things would definitely be my pick. So let's go over to Best Song. And this one, it shouldn't be contentious. It really shouldn't, because What Was I Made For has the Golden Globe and it has the Grammy Award for Best Song of the Year. So that should just be walking away with it. It has to take it, right? But that said... I'm Just Ken is also nominated. It has the Critics' Choice Award. It's more fun, and it could possibly upset. Slash, it could also vote split. What if some of the people that would have voted for Barbie are split between these two and something else pushes ahead with passion? For example, was Azhe from uh, Killers of the Flower Moon? There's a possibility, I think, that a song like that from a movie that has passion and would be getting entirely different voters from the ones who would go for Barbie, that could pull ahead but it would be unwise to predict it. I'm sticking with what was I made for because of that Grammy Award win. I think there's five types of voters for best original song. There is the Diane Warren shills, who are always going to vote for her regardless of what the competition is. There are the people like myself who would probably vote for what works best inside of the film. There's the people who will vote for the song that they like most outside of the film. And then this year we add in those who are going to be voting for the song from their favorite movie of the bunch. And then for the song that they think is the most fun, and I guess we can add a sixth category, which is voting for the artist you like the most. And I think splitting up those six votes, they split between what was I made for and I'm just kin with your personal bias 
going to what song you like more in the film between Kim and Was I Made For, Diane Warren takes one of those. So like, let's say they do vote split. I don't know if it would be the killer's one, even if I love that song so much and that may honestly get my personal vote from this bunch. It might be Diane Warren shills, but I don't know, no, does I she don't. have enough shills to, to overtake? I, I, I don't think so. So I am also leaning What Was I Made For. Billie Eilish is someone who is magnetic to awards. She's in a category, she usually wins. Here, she'll probably win. My one holdback is, I'm just Ken has what it takes to overtake it, but I do think there are people who won't vote for it because it's a joke song and they like their ballads, they like their important songs. That's why we always see political songs win in this category. While What Was I Made For is not a political song, kind of is a little bit in terms of like a feminist pro song uh, which isn't an issue at all i just think it's more of a reason why some people will go out of their way to vote for it so i am also going what was i made for if i had a ballot though i might vote split myself away from the barbie songs just because i like them so much and go for killers but in terms of the artists i like the most john baptiste is here but i don't like that song at all my vote would easily be what was i made for it's one of the best songs of the year for sure I'm just Ken. I don't love the song. I love how it's used in the movie, but it's not a great song on its own. The lyrics are pretty basic, but it's, it's fun. fun to listen to. It's though. really fun. It's really charming. And again, the sequence that it's in is fantastic. If we are voting purely on how a song is used in the movie, that wins. 100%. But otherwise, it's what was I made for. It's so weird that every year it's kind of different how best song gets handed out. Because like I mentioned, sometimes it is to the political song. Sometimes it's in the song from the movie that you just like the most. Sometimes it's the song that just works best inside the film. And sometimes it's just the most catchy song. It's always just so weird how the race turns out. But I think regardless of those three songs that we mentioned, the two Barbies, the Killer song, great winner. The other two would not be a great winner. No, they wouldn't. And to be honest, I don't think Diane Warren ever wins unless she starts writing songs for movies that are actually existing. Well, they Things don't want that her. Are, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think the last time she wrote for a film that was like a genuine Oscar contender without her uh, was Silver Linings Playbook, and she didn't get nominated for that, weirdly enough. Otherwise, like, she needs something like Armageddon again to come along. She needs a big blockbuster that needs, like, an anthem. Um, and if she can do that, then she, she could win. That is going to bring us to, I think, one of the most talked about up-in-the-air categories, best costume design mm. we have two real candidates here we have barbie one critic's choice also won its respective costume guild and then we have poor things won the bafta won its specific costume guild and it's kind of really interesting how you want to go about this because i think there's great cases for both and there's not much detraction from either i guess i would ask like what has the most costumes because to me it's barbie you barbie. look at barbie it's flashy, it's in your face, that movie's about fashion, and in the past we've definitely seen films that feature fashion as like the core part of the film. Think back to Phantom Thread, think back to Cruella. Uh, those are films that have fashion as the focal point of the movie, and they win because of that. And Barbie has fashion as like the focal point. You think Barbie, you think pretty clothes, you think pretty dresses. And yes, I've heard people say, well, but they didn't create any of it. Like it's all just, they're just reusing stuff. But that doesn't change anything because design work isn't always just about creation. It's also about curation. And what they had to do was make choices, going into these archives, finding pieces and making it all fit together for a cohesive film. And then they had to build the life-size versions of these doll costumes. I think that is uh, an outstanding achievement. Now, I guess Poor Things you could say has the angle of it being period piece work. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know why people are riding so high on poor things for costumes. Barbie just makes so much sense. I definitely agree with that point you made about curation because you can go to some previous winners that aren't creating their costumes per se, like Black Panther. They won twice, which I think will be a conversation for Dune next year, but it's adapting something that is already pre-existing. It's just choosing the way to go about adapting it. And I think there's various winners throughout the last decade where it's doing that same exact thing. And I mean, going back to the favorite last time, it lost out to a movie like Black Panther. So I just feel like this is Barbie. There's all this talk about Barbie possibly being a star is born. It's just winning song. It's not winning anything else. While it may be struggling in a lot of other places, costumes is not a place it has struggled at. The only time it's lost 
is at BAFTA, where even if Barbie was like, let's say number two in picture, it was never going to win the BAFTA over Poor Things. Exactly. Yes, a hundred percent. And that makes me think of Black Panther, which Black Panther was never going to win the BAFTA. It wasn't nominated for the BAFTA uh, either time that it won the Oscar. Let's just look at like what stats to ride with, because Critics' Choice and BAFTA are the split here. Barbie has Critics' Choice, and Poor Things has BAFTA. Now, Critics' Choice has only gone wrong twice since 2009. In 2019, they picked Dolomite Is My Name. That did not get an Oscar nomination. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them was the shock of the century, and neither Critics' Choice or BAFTA got that one right. And then BAFTA has gone wrong three times since 2009. Of course, Fantastic Beasts they got wrong, and both Black Panthers. So to me, what this is saying is ride with critics choice they get it right more often and they don't have the snobbiness problem that BAFTA has if I want to put it like that uh BAFTA not giving it to Black Panther feels exactly the same to me as BAFTA not giving it to Barbie they were never going to give it to that movie especially over something more traditional and more British like poor things so I am sticking with Barbie, and Barbie would be my personal vote as well. I would also not be snobby and go with Barbie and costume design. Production design, on the other hand, I think there is still a debate, but it's not as close as you could kind of make the costume design. And even though neither you or I think costume design is a real argument, but I think the production design one is even less of an argument at this moment because Poor Things has the Guild, it has the BAFTA, Barbie just has Crick's Choice. Keep in mind, Crick's Choice gave Barbie the most nominations ever, and with having so many nominations, you are bound to win at least one of them. I think Barbie has great production design and may be my winner here, may not, but you can't deny that Poor Things has the strength at this moment. But the last thing I just want to say about Poor Things before I hand it over to you is this kind of plays in part with Actress to me. When's the last time we had a solo production design winner that felt like it was supposed to be a solo production design winner? We've seen time and time out production design winners usually need to have at least something else. Even if it's expected not to win anything else or to some other movie expected to win like Babylon that would have been a solo winner. They say, screw that, we're, we're going all quiet. We, we have to have this pair with something. I think the only example is Alice in Wonderland, which is like the most insane nope. Alice win. in Wonderland, uh, I think it did win oh, the costumes. Oh, yeah. And th yeah, that won an, an extra award. So that's Sweeney the Todd last, is the last one. Sweeney Todd, okay. Sweeney Todd. And like, I don't know, is poor thing's going to be Sweeney Todd? That just feels wrong. No, but I mean, there are other things this year that we're saying it's like a first time for for certain things. Yeah. Stats are meant to be broken. The Critics' Choice is even better at predicting production design than it is costumes, and it's really good at costumes because in the past 15 years, Critics' Choice has gotten three wrong, BAFTA has gotten six wrong. Every single time that Critics' Choice and BAFTA have split, they've picked the Critics' Choice winner, except 2012 when both BAFTA and Critics' Choice got it wrong. But we're in unprecedented territory specifically because Poor Things beat Barbie in its own category at the Art Directors Guild. That means we are in such uncharted territory right now. There, We have no idea what's exactly going to happen, but I think I'm leaning Poor Things just because it has those two. But that said, if Barbie wins here, then I'm never doubting the critic's choice ever again. While I think I enjoy Barbies more on a personal level, I think that Poor Things just has all the boxes ticked off to win this category. It beat them head to head at the Guild. There's, I, I mean, sure, you can make a case, but there's no reason why the American Guild went with Poor Things over Barbie. I feel like if anything, Critics' Choice would have gone with Poor Things and the Guild would have gone with Barbie. But the fact that the Guild went Poor Things is what's really tipping it for me. I guess the reasoning there is that the Art Directors Guild are art directors. They really know their shit. They're the ones who study this. They, they really, really understand it. Barbie, it's an easier thing to just hop on as like, you know, you're seeing it from a distance and going, wow, that's flashy, that's cool. They brought those toy sets to life. So I, I think the argument that I'd have for Barbie, if we're looking at a bunch of voters at large in the Academy, you know, a small amount of them are actually production designers and art directors, they might go poor things. But is the rest of the Academy going to go poor things or are they going to go Barbie? I feel really weird predicting poor things here. I just, I have a feeling it's going to split between the two of them, but I could also see Barbie take both of them. I, on the other hand, cannot see poor things taking both of them. So I think if you're being really cautious, maybe just go Barbie in both categories. 
I just see a split happening. It's mostly, you know, poor things having ADG and BAFTA. But I guess the counterpoint to that would be last year's costume design category, where the only reason I didn't go with Black Panther Wakanda Forever last year was because it had lost the costume designers guild to everything everywhere all at once. And that made me feel like the film was a little bit weaker uh, because it didn't have that guild. And looking at this production design category, Barbie doesn't have that guild right now. But it does have Critics' Choice, which is the best predictor here. So I don't know. Maybe I will flip to Barbie. This is this is one that I'm really, really up in the air about. But I, th- I think for now I'm going to stick Poor Things. And Poor Things would be my pick. Boom, boom. So we differed a few times on our personal picks, but we are still in alignment with our Oscar predictions. Right. And I would say maybe they would break and make up in hairstyling, but um, I have a jump ship because I'm over on Team Maestro. I've been saying all year long when I even had Dune at the beginning and then switching over to poor things, I am going to ride with who the guild goes to. I'm not getting burned by this bridge two years in a row like I did last year with the Whale versus Elvis. I did say that poor things was going to win BAFTA. That wasn't going to affect my viewpoint at all. It was always gonna come to the guild and once poor things lost that i sadly had to move off of poor things so asking like two weeks ago i had poor things winning the four oscars i now have it down to just two maestro wins it has the guild the guild basically every single year they pick the oscar winner you gotta ride with that i think people are jumping through hoops to justify why maestro will lose and it's just because people don't really like maestro but the academy does like maestro so seven they will I know they're going to go for it and it's going to win. I would love to see poor things win. It would be my personal pick, but it just won't happen. I would also go with poor things on a personal level, but my show's work is very impressive, especially on a rewatch. I appreciate those elements a lot more. And I guess my original reason for not going my show was just, I guess maybe more hoping that they would move away from biopic stuff like that or just gimmick type stuff. And after rewatching my show, I saw it wasn't just the nose gimmick. There was a lot of yeah. stuff with aging throughout, with skincare throughout that I found a lot more impressive. But I'm still going to hold true. 2025 Oscars, Dune Part 2 is going to be number one. But here's a category where we're finally going to choose something different from each other. Yeah. Uh, that's visual effects because you are riding with a creator. I'm riding with Godzilla Minus One. I want you to make your case first because uh, I, I'm very against the creator winning, even though it's my personal pick. Well, I mean, you just look at what we all were saying all year long for predicting. Your visual effects winner needs to either be A, a Best Picture nominee, we don't have one here, or B, an additional nomination. What's the movies here with additional nominations? It's Napoleon, it's Mission Impossible, it's the creator. Then you can go to other guilds. Mission Impossible, did it win anywhere? No. Napoleon, did it win anywhere? What? It didn't even win BAFTA? No. What did? The creator won at the Visual Effects Society. And then three, you want to go back to movies that aren't beloved but still win in this category. You go to the Golden Compass. It had a horrible review score. It didn't make much money. But you know what it had? It had an additional Oscar nomination. And you know what has one here? It made about the same amount of money, has about the same critic scores the creator. I understand why people are moving away from this film. It wasn't a hit. A lot of people just left it feeling like blah, but there's precedent for stuff like the creator to win. I mean, like Jungle Book won with no other nominations just because it had the best work. It won at the Guild. Golden Compass won with not much precursor support outside of VES, but it also had an additional Oscar nomination. And here, I guess, if we want to be crazy about it, if the the love and if the support for Godzilla was that strong, why did that not make the sound lineup? Let alone the lineup. Why did that not make the short list while the creator did? It for that. I, I just feel like if, I mean, the creator wasn't having much of a push in sound either. But I guess my final, final point would be, this is something we talked about before, but I, I, think it, I think it fits here and it fits into some of the other characters we've talked about throughout today as well. This is the basically the culmination of mainly domestic Hollywood voters. Yes, there's some international voting members, but it's still the majority Hollywood. Awarding Godzilla, regardless of your thoughts of the movie or your thoughts on the work, is awarding your competition while awarding the creator is rewarding your own. And I'm not saying that's the way it should go, but we've seen that in the past, and they 99% of the time go with themselves in these situations. That's why 1917 beat Parasite in Best Picture, right? That's why I said 99% of the time. That is the exception. 
And that was a sweeper. It's maybe not in terms of precursors, but it swept at the show. I also just want to ask you, I mean, what year did the Golden Compass come out? 2007. Uh, 2007. Yeah. Where you're using that as your example. Two categories ago, when we were talking about production design, what was the reason that you said that it couldn't be a solo winner? Because the last winner was Sweeney Todd. When did that come out? 2007. So I, I, I see what you're putting down there. Here's what I'm thinking. Creator only has VES. It lost Critics' Choice to Oppenheimer. It lost BAFTA to Poor Things. Both of those times, they didn't award the film that had the best visual effects in the category. They awarded the film that they liked the most. Yes, in this category, we don't have a Best Picture nominee. We don't have an Oppenheimer or a Poor Things that they could jump ship to. But we do have Godzilla, which has so much audience hype. And with some of these voters watching it for the first time, because beforehand it was probably mostly visual effects artists that watched the film. Now that people are actually watching it for the first time, this is a film that people are going to like the most in the category. And I guess what I'm thinking, going back to some of these other awards where, you know, the guilds don't represent the general voters. The guilds represent people who know their shit. The VES is only voted on by visual effects artists, whereas the Oscar is voted on by people that don't know anything about visual effects. And I do think the visual effects category often becomes a popularity contest. Instead of being all about like, oh, what has the best visual effects? It's what's the film we liked the most that has good visual effects. Rare exceptions to this being Ex Machina. Uh, Ex Machina beating a lineup of all films more popular than it with Star Wars, with The Martian, which, with Mad Max, and with The Revenant. Like that is a crazy lineup for it to beat those movies, and yet it did. So that's the one exception to the most popular movie winning here. In a lineup where none of these movies are popular, they might just go with the one that has passion. And I don't see passion for the creator. I see people who know their shit in visual effects saying, yeah, it's the best. I agree it's a popularity contest, but if you're an Academy voting member, you open up your portal. Let's say you have nominations come out, you have time to watch 10 movies that you didn't watch. Are they going to pick a movie with one nomination? Or are they going to pick someone that has two nominations, three nominations, like every other film in this category besides Guardians has? I think they would go for something like that so they can check off more boxes of stuff to watch. Why well, I do agree, if you sit someone down, you make them watch all five of these movies, most of them are going to come out saying Godzilla is the best movie. I think you can still point to people who say Godzilla is the best movie and may still be voting for Godzilla, and they will admit Godzilla has the weakest effects in this category. Does that matter? Usually it doesn't, like you said. But what I think it does matter in years when you don't have a Best Picture movie, because you talked about popularity contests, we don't have that popular movie here, because while people have been saying Godzilla is a box office revelation, it made about the same as the creator worldwide. Those are the two by far lowest grossing films in this category this year. I mean, Mission Impossible made like 600 million. Guardians made like 700 million. Napoleon made like 200 million. All have more eyes on it before you open up the portals. And I think it just really comes down to how do people vote? Do they vote with their eyes? Do they vote with their heart? Do they vote with their ears? Because I think at the end of the day, if Godzilla wins this category, it's not because of their heart. It's not because of their eyes. They're voting for it because other people are telling them to vote for it. I, I do think it is heart, though, uh, because the whole Oh, I don't think those people Godzilla. watched the movie. Outside of the portal, there's not a physical way for anyone on this earth to watch Godzilla Minus One, and it's been like that for a month. But that doesn't change the fact that voters are able to watch it. And to the point that you're putting forward, if they're going to vote for something that you know, would be easy for them to watch in the platform, something that would be easy for them to access, and something that has multiple nominations, I would say that Mission Impossible is more po uh, is more popular than the creator. It's more well-liked. Mm -hmm. This is a category where I could actually see this award go to any of the nominees because I think I they agree. all have an argument for it. Mission Impossible doesn't have great visual effects. Neither does Godzilla. But it is popular, and people might just go to the name recognition while looking at their ballot and going, ah, I don't give a shit about any of these movies. I guess I'll just go for Mission Impossible. I liked that movie. So maybe that's an angle for it. I'm sticking with Godzilla Minus One. I just think there's passion for this film. What we're seeing time and time again is the creator has the opposite of passion. Anytime they can pick something else, they're picking something else. I hear that point, but I guess the films that they're picking are films like when we mentioned before of Zone of Interest and with Anatomy of a Fall in their category, 
Of course they're going with that one. I mean, Critics' Choice going with Oppenheimer, the biggest film of the year, of course they're going there. BAFTA going with the British movie, of course they're going to do that. And the only time where creator... But did you predict creator... of those? Like, is it really an of course that they're doing that? Because, like, I don't think I anyone... I think I did expecting... Oppenheimer at Critics' Choice. I, I give you BAFTA. I give you BAFTA. I mean, I feel like Oppenheimer was the favorite going in Critics' Choice. At that time, Oppenheimer was the favorite to win the category because it hadn't been left off a shortlist at that point. Uh, no, 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 because Critics' Choice happened in January, and shortlists are released, like, late December. So it oh, had been uh, drawn maybe. from the Oscars. It's 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 a portion of Monday Morning Quarterback, and it's a portion of, like, I don't know. Like, I, I do hear the point that creator is not a film anyone's passionate about, besides visual effects artists. Yeah. But I think when we have to go to the last example of something like this, yeah, of course, it's 2007. That is the last example we have of a film winning that doesn't have passion when the rest of the category didn't have passion for it either. Like the alternative is Transformers. Yeah. And are, is the Oscars going to go with, end. are the Oscars going to go for those movies? No. And I mean, you could make the case that's equivalent for them going for something like Napoleon. I just feel like our case all season long is, oh, the creator can't win because it doesn't have another nomination. It goes out and gets that other nomination. It's like, oh, the creator can't win because uh, it doesn't have any real guild wins. It wins the guild. Keep in mind, Godzilla lost its guild to Guardians. So like... Godzilla had a chance to win. Did it? I, I don't think it was nominated. Character design, animation at the VES Guild, it lost to Guardians. Oh, Rocket beat out Godzilla. Yep. Yeah. Um, and like they had a chance to reward it, and the passion wasn't there for it. Granted, as we both mentioned, and it, it is visual effects artists, but like again, with viewership, I think Godzilla is just a, a very niche thing, which, I mean, they did nominate it, so that broke my expectation for that. But, like, I, I just don't know. I feel like I'm going to eat my words come Sunday. But I just feel like all year long, my whole thing was like, oh, creator has to do this. It does this. Oh, creator needs to do this. It does this. And I feel like other people have said that, too. And it's just, like, the fact that the Oscars are in March and we've had these nominations for two and a half months. It's like, oh, what is there to do now? I will just say, like, if the creator does win, which it very well could, I just, I don't think you should say, well, it was obvious all along. Because, yes, it, it looked like the winner. It hasn't done everything that it should have done. It should have gotten Critics' Choice. It should have gotten BAFTA. Those were wins that it should have had that it lost. And so it does make a lot of sense that we are so questioning this category, even though on its surface, the creator looks like a perfect winner. And in any other year, you know, this, this is the type of movie that would win, but it's just not getting that passion. But with all that being said, I mean, I think maybe this is personal bias coming in. I think the creator is the best in the show here. Again, going to narratives and stuff, Godzilla's narrative works for the creator as well. You have a yes. limited budget. You do a lot of impressive stuff with it. The director is a part of your visual effects team. It's the same thing. It's just one movie's liked more by the general public compared to the other. But I would like to bring in mind, again, budgets play a part in this. Creator made less return for its money, but both films grossed essentially the same amount worldwide. Now let's move over to these short film categories. A lot could happen here. I think people are kind of really debating between them. And I'm just going to say off the top, I am going with my heart on every single one of these categories because my favorite films in each category are the ones that I think I see the strongest angle for. So let's start with documentary short. There are three possibilities in this category, in my opinion. There's Nai Nai and Waipo, which is sweet, it's beautiful, it's heartfelt, and it's being promoted by Disney. They have it on Disney+, Plus, so it's getting that Disney money. Another film with that Disney money being released by Searchlight is The Last Repair Shop. This one is directed by Ben Proudfoot, though, who just won two years ago for The Queen of Basketball. And if Ben Proudfoot won, he would be joining a list of only six other people with more than one Oscar in this category. So the stats are against him. It is very unlikely to get a second Oscar in this specific category. And the final one to talk about is the ABCs of book banning. This is politically relevant. It's not the best film in the category. Uh, in fact, a lot of people say it's terrible. I disagree. I think it's fine. Uh, but it is definitely the political message film. And if they want to send a message, which they sometimes do, they will go with the ABCs of book banning. My pick here is Nai Nai and Waipo. It is my favorite film in the category, and I think it's going to hit all the right notes to get a win. I think it has what The Last Repair Shop has in being a very sweet and memorable film, and I just think it has enough 
to get to that win. I am kind of lost of what to do in this category because I think he made very valid points for all three of those films. I do agree those are also the three in contention. I've seen so much campaigning for 99 White Poe in The Last Repair Shop where I haven't really seen any for the ABCs of book banning. But this is also a category that I don't think really campaigning matters all that much because I think these are three categories that people literally could just vote with the titles. Yes. And the ABC and of book banning is the title that you would vote for here. And if people do seek out to watch these, like what some could do at a cinema when they're showing all these, or even in the portal, the ABCs of book banning has, I think, the most emotional message of the three in terms of what it's trying to say. While 99 White Poe is maybe more heartfelt, book banning is, has a point. And from what I've been told, you are told that point again and again yes. and again and again. And again, and I just think it kind of just comes down to how many people actually watch these versus how many people actually just vote based off of the title. I would think on paper, Last Repair Shop would be the winner here, but you mentioned the thing about Proudfoot would join in such a short list. I think that's something that some people, especially people in the know, would know going in and probably not support that sort of thing. And then the director of 99 White Poe currently is having a moment, so maybe he had some extra votes after his film that was at Sundance. But I, I think I am just airing on the side of politics, and I think I'm going with ABC of Book Banning because if you just look at these uh, films, that's the one that's going to get the most, just like the people who want to fill out a full ballot without actually watching everything. I want it to be 99 White Poe so bad. Uh, that I'm going with my heart here, but it's maybe not wise to go with my heart. I just, I don't see how anyone could watch this movie and not vote for it, because it's so memorable. You've got the farting grandmas. The farting grandmas deserve an Oscar. And I mean, every year there's at least one winner that is uh, not very liked by the people who actually watch the shorts. And uh, this is the one I am going to pick this year. I know a lot of other people will pick that one in an animated short. But mm -hmm. I think this is the one that would get the win this year. Speaking of animated short, this is a category where it could also go to three different films. And the one that you're talking about there is War is Over, uh, based, inspired by the music of John and Yoko, which is awful. It's such a bad movie. I don't know anyone who likes War is Over. And in fact, it would be probably, I think, the worst reviewed short on Letterboxd to ever win this category. So that is a knock against it. Meanwhile, people really like... 95 senses i've not heard anyone see 95 senses and not like it i just don't see how anyone could get out of war is over and and vote for that over 95 senses which is also sentimental which is also sappy it's also a very emotionally manipulative film but 95 senses just does it so much better the only reason that war is over would win is because of the name recognition of john lennon and yoko ono if war is over wins it's because people didn't watch the movies and they voted based on the titles that's the only reason it would win but there's also a possibility that letter to a pig wins and letter to a pig what I've learned over the years, in the short films, you can never underestimate a Holocaust film. Never. Even the most inane and just bland Holocaust movies, like Colette in Documentary Short a few years ago, you can't underestimate their possibility of, of a win. They pull them out of nowhere sometimes. So Letter to a Pig is possible, but it would be a distant third place for me. Yeah, I, I'm kind of like contradicting everything I just in the last category where if they just read the titles they're gonna go war is over I went book banning the last one but I, I think the difference between book banning and war is over is book banning will still get people to vote for it who do watch it while it's maybe not the majority of people yeah. there are still people who watch that and think it's very effective I haven't seen war is over but just from the reactions online and our discord to other pundits um, no one seems to like this movie and no one seems to really take a message away so I think that that is a detracting mark to it. My one concern though is why I still kind of want to pick Wars Over. People who do watch these, which may not be the large majority of Oscar voters, uh, might split between Letters to a Pig and 95 Senses and by default Wars Over wins by the name checking because you don't know Letters to a Pig is a Holocaust movie by title. And I think if there was something in the title, that would be the easy win here because the animation, from what I've been told, is very fantastic. I, I said narratives don't matter 
matter in other categories. And they don't matter in the shorts. They might matter here, at least for what I'm going to try to pull out of my ass here and say 95 cents. Because how cool would it be if Napoleon Dynamite director wins an Oscar? And I mean, if you're given an Oscar for name recognition and the other short category we haven't talked about from a director that you like, why can't we get this one? Dumb pick, but um, I'm trying something different this year in the shorts where I'm not picking the number one. Talk live action short where it is a battle between Wes Anderson and who else? I mean, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar looks like such a clear, clear winner. This category, maybe you could make an argument that they don't award big directors in it. But that's more of an argument in the nominations than in the wins. I think if they mm -hmm. have a chance to award someone like Wes Anderson, they're not going to think twice about it. Uh, that said, we should give credence to a political pick, which would be red, white, and blue. Uh, it's very relevant to what's going on in America at the moment, and it could potentially be the alternate pick to Wes Anderson. But I think it's just Wes Anderson. It's the best film here, and it's the most easily accessible. If we're talking about voters who might have watched one movie, they would have checked out the Wes Anderson stuff on Netflix, and then, bam, it's here. Easy vote. I, I think this is pretty cut and dry. It's Henry Sugar. And like you said, if they derive from that because of gatekeeping, they could go politics, red, white, and blue. They could go with movie star, the after, or they could go with quote, quote, the best of Night of Fortune. But still, I don't think anything really matters here. I don't know why people talk so much about like, oh, there's an overdue narrative here. And like, oh, they need to award Christopher Nolan. They need to do this. But when it comes to live action short, people are like, no one's going to think about that. Of course they are. They're going to see Wes Anderson go. He doesn't have one yet, right? We should give him this. I agree. But at the same time, to me, if I was Wes Anderson, I wouldn't want to win this. Because <laughs> I don't want like, oh, my one Oscar is me winning a short category when I've made so many features and been nominated for director and picture and screenplay. This kind of seems like, oh, we're never going to give you one of those Diane it's Warren honorary Oscars. This is your... Yeah, it's your consolation prize. So I, I get that angle, but I also get yours of like, no, if people like Wes Anderson, they're just going to vote for Wes Anderson here. Yeah, people like Wes Anderson, and they liked this movie. It's going to win. And I do, I do just think that it's making the category overly complicated to go anywhere else. I'd be very shocked if anything other than Henry Sugar won. I would agree with that, but that's gonna reach us to the end of this Oscar prediction episode. It's been a pretty long one. I feel like we breezed through a lot, but those categories that are really tight, we went super in depth about them. I mean, actress, visual effects, I'm sure there was at least one other category that we were somewhat maybe disagreeing on, but you out there, I'm sure you have something you disagree with us on, so let us know down below and make sure to subscribe because our reactions to the Oscars will be coming very shortly after on like Monday or Tuesday of next week. But until then, my name's Dill. And my name's Matt, and thank you so much for sticking with us. This has been Fantasy Film Ball. <laughs>